we've always focused on two things with injury. Oh, doing too much and doing it wrong, right? You're throwing too many pitches. You're throwing your deliveries bad. The new thing I think is coming out is you're doing it too, too much the same. Right? Mm-hmm. I think variability, adding different conditions in practice is a way that you can, you know, not doing the same delivery, doing the same delivery actually every time is that's what's going to hurt you, <laughs> right? You, you stress the exact same joints and same things. So adding a little bit variation, I think, is a way to kind of mitigate injury. Hey, this is More Than Velocity. I'm Bart Pear here with Ryan Croton and Jordan Oseguera. And today we've got a, a treat for you. We've got a gentleman, Rob Gray. He's a professor at Arizona State University, a doctor in experimental psychology. He's done a lot of research um, in a lot of different fields, but a lot about how we learn, not only just in sports, but um, driving and some other things that are, that are quite interesting um, and are going to apply uh, to pitching and just baseball performance in general. Uh, Ryan, I think you originally met Rob uh, at the Angels. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I uh, I really was fascinated with Rob's work um, academically. I'm a biomechanist, so I studied how to quantify human movement. But um, the coaching science part was not as strong, and at least in my field, as it was relating to baseball. And then just seeing what Rob has done. Um, with his research and, and skills acquisition and retaining uh, coaching information, feedback, and all sorts of different elements um, and how to improve our coaching really got me interested in Rob. And I, I had him come out and speak with some of our staff during spring training. And he's just a, a fascinating guy. I've heard him speak at a bunch of major conferences and he also hosted his own. And I, I really see the high quality that's that's done in his work and the applicability competition. So, you know, I um, I, I kind of want to begin, Rob, and kind of lead you because obviously we're, we're focused a lot on throwing athletes. And um, you had put out a research article that was very interesting to me in terms of how we should be training pitchers and how to give them feedback and conditions in improving command. So if you could kind of go into the details about the paper that you talked about avoidance, you know, Mm -hmm. when we give it, when we tell athletes, it's kind of, it's not verbal, this is more visual, but what, you know, the, the effects of what happens when we tell athletes to, to not do something, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. And then thanks for having me on guys. (laughs) It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so that study. So one of the things I've been really interested in is in, in the recent years is, you know, kind of as data, we get more and more data, more and more analytics is how you actually give that back to the athletes, right? We collect so much stuff and kind of the, one of the points I like to make is we really need a coach in between the data and the athlete because it can be very dangerous if you get it really give data the wrong way. You can get an athlete really internally focused on the body, which can be disruptive. But in this study, what we did was kind of use, we took a bunch of pitchers and we had them do a, uh, basically a very simple throwing task, you know, pitching. And what we gave, we set up was kind of the traditional thing where you give a hitter strengths and weaknesses with kind of like a heat map. So, you know, they, here's their average when you pitch it low and outside, here's when you pitch it up and inside. And um, we had a couple of different conditions, but what we found was that when you um, kind of point out the areas you should avoid, you know, the hot zones where the hitter is really well, it actually caused people what was called an ironic error. So they actually, you produce the action to achieve the thing you don't want. But the example I think more people are familiar with is like golf. When you see a big lake on the left, you're like, don't hit it left, don't hit it left. Or, or the one, don't think about pink elephants, right? It, it actually <laughs> activates the, the, the motor program to produce that exact behavior um, that you're trying to avoid. And that's really what we found. We found, um, you know, when we put, especially when we put them under pressure, we kind of made a competition and, and a lot, what, what would happen is they throw in the exact zone they were trying to miss, right? Trying to avoid. And so what we did is when we kind of gave the information where we only told them their goal, right? Here's where you want the ball to go. We took out kind of the hot zones. They did much better. Um, they had less chance of 
of making these mistakes of throwing it exactly where you don't want to. So, yeah, I find that I think that's an example of, you know, how you have to think about what you're giving the, you know, using the data to plan things and design practice is one thing, but what you actually tell the athlete, what you, how you generate cues, I think is an, is different, right? And we need to think about that. And I think that's an example of that for sure. I think we should flip it over to Jordan because, you know, Jordan, I, I don't know how much you know about Jordan, Rob, but um, he was my pitching analyst with with the Angels. He's a pitching coach. He scouted, he, you know, did a lot of front office work. He's just a, a wealth of knowledge on both the data side and also working with athletes. And so, Jordan, I don't know, because I never really sat in on how, to, you know, pitching coaches go through data with their pitchers. But I'm curious if, you know, we're, we're giving them information in terms of, you know, showing them their hot zones and cold zones and like, what do they retain? I think you got more of an experience there. So, so I, I've been lucky to like, as everyone knows, my mentor who's been listening, my mentor was Tom house. You know, he's a PhD in sports psychology. He pitched and coached, I think for a combined 135 years in the big leagues, you know, something absurd like that. But, you know, he, he tells the story and I'm not going to do it justice, obviously. So people should just get on YouTube and Google Tom House, Don, Don Zimmer story, you know, there is time <clears throat> with the Red Sox. Um, but he was uh, he was pitching. I want to say it was in Yankee Stadium and there was a, the ball exchange. He came in and he goes, I don't care what you do. Just don't let him take you deep. He says less before he can get back to the dugout, they're hitting the spread in a negative way because he just gave up the walk off in Yankee Stadium. <laughs> and he says from there, it's, it's always resonating in his head. He's like, well, well, why was it? All I could think about was giving up a home run and doing all those things. And, you know, he's telling that story and that got into how he started phrasing his scouting reports. And then once he got his PhD and doing all the, all the work through sports psychology, he started to understand this is how you do scouting reports. This is how you phrase things is you do need to know what the hitter's good and bad at, because if your strength matches up with his strength, well, then you better figure it out. And another, another instance Tom always uses, he goes, when the higher levels you play, the more information you do need, because it's this chess game of, I know that you know that I know <laughs> that your strength is this, and you know that I know that you know that my strength is this. Oh, no, what do we do? So you have to start taking what you do well and using it in those areas to beat a guy in his strength every once in a while to set those up. And we've talked a little bit about it, but um, again, I don't think we've released the podcast and I'm sure this one will come out prior to with effective velocity and pitch tunneling and all those other things that go into it. But what Rob was talking about there is they've almost oversimplified it in, I'm going to say two thirds of baseball to where they take it and they go, here's your strength, only do this. And then they would go, oh, you know, just, it was bad luck. But when this guy only does the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, hitters at a higher level will make an adjustment. So they take the guy who has the, you know, 22 inch induced vertical break at 97. And they say, you only throw the ball at the top of the zone. And then you'll beat a guy with a change up below the zone on occasion. And you'll, you're, you're going to throw to, you know, the outer third only with your slider, but then you face Mike Napoli. And it's like, well, Mike, Na Mike Napoli punishes the, punishes the ball at the top of the zone. And then you wonder why you can't get Mike Napoli out. Well, sometimes you're going to have to, to go away from your strength to beat somebody. And there's almost this oversimplification in scouting reports now. And then there was, you know, 15 years ago, an overcomplication of scouting reports <laughs> that you leave the meeting and you're like, I remember talking with Joe Blanton and, you know, Cole Hamels as well. And they were going over these scouting reports. They were telling me like, yeah, this is what I get from my org. And he's just like, you know, I, I leave my, my, my pregame meeting going, Apparently every hitter I'm facing is Superman and I can't throw anything, you know? <laughs> so what they started doing was they just started going, look, I'm not going to those meetings anymore. I'm just going to watch video and figure it out on my own. But I think we're, we have enough data now and enough practical experience that we can combine the objective and the subjective and create some really good plans. And I think we're close to doing that. So I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of obviously went on a rambling uh, tangent there, which I'm good for at least four <laughs> or five per episode with uh, as Bart points out. But if you can take that, and, and the person who's done it the best for me is still Tom because he played, he coached, he's got an extreme background in education, and he's also been able to take that with guys like, you know, Brad Boxberger, who during his first little bit at USC couldn't really get a ton of guys out. He was this big, huge pro prospect. No one could figure out why he struggled. Tom came in, rephrased the scouting report. Next thing you know, he's in the big leagues with, you know, the Rays and whoever, what a couple organizations. 
So just the phrasing of it does make a big difference because there's going to be that emotional buy-in based on something that if I tell Ryan, Hey, don't yank this ball. When you throw it, stop yanking the ball. When you throw it, yank, 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 <laughs> as opposed to, Hey, really drive through the target on this. Now he's going, okay, I can drive through or, you know, pull down with your finger, whatever you want to phrase it as the phrasing gives you different emotional responses. And that's different for each player. And I think what the really good front offices, scouting, advanced scouting departments and pitching coaches can do is understand how Bart, how Rob and how Ryan all emotionally process things differently and phrase it in that context for them. Yeah, I, I think there's a good point. A lot of good points there, Jordan. But one of them is that I would distinguish being data driven where you're like a slave to the scouting reports versus data informed. You still mm-hmm. got to let the pitcher and catcher compete and the coach, like see how the hitter reacts to the fastball inside and change your, you're right. Cause they're going to adjust to you. So exactly, you have to yeah. let it. So if you're just a slave to this, Oh, he never hits this type of pitch that you're, you're going to get burned <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, more. Th- yeah. 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 I, I think what's interesting too, cause I've, I've sat in on a pitching meeting once when I was with the Baltimore Orioles and they were going through the lineup of the, uh, for the Yankees and what each, hitter does and certain counts and to, into what pitchers. And then, you know, we had this, we had a sidearm pitcher and Darren O'Day, you know, whose ball does a different thing. They deliver differently than most of the pitchers, but he gets lumped in with what this pitch, what this hitter does on a right-handed um, pitcher, you know, cause he's right-handed. And uh, I think, you know, the data informed is kind of like when we need to let I think we, it also resonates with me that we need to let the athlete also give us feedback in terms of the, their plan, you know? Yeah. Um, one, one thing I want to point out on that is sometimes the conf- the mental emotional aspect of the player may match up with the scout report. Sometimes it may not. So just because a player's pitch shapes, his previous statistics say, this is what he should do. If that mental emotional aspect isn't there, it doesn't mean it's going to happen because now it goes right back into what Rob was talking about earlier. When you say don't or do, you know, maybe that guy, even if you don't tell him, that could be what's running that guy's internal monologue. He's mm-hmm. going, well, well, don't do this. Oh, I just did it, you know, or I'm, I'm not comfortable throwing glove side with this pitch. I'm really comfortable throwing it arm side to get it glove side. But now when you're telling the catcher that he can't do this, now you keep getting in that guy's head and, you know, understanding that emotional construct of the player is you you said something perfect data driven versus data informed and again i have the attention span of a gnat so i apologize Mm -hmm. pretty sure you said data informed Mm -hmm. was the word right Mm -hmm. and you you know ryan's heard me say it baseball works in these black and whites it's like you're either data driven or you're anti-data well why can't it the pendulum land in the middle why can't we do both you know how do we how do we program that because if you're talking to, you know, a player who, and, I, and I've worked with players like this, who didn't have a computer in their house until they went to college, as opposed to the player who was, you know, you're, you're mandated, you're going to have keyboard classes and everything from the time you can start speaking, you're going to learn technology, you're going to understand this, you're going to know how to run an Excel sheet where this other guy's like, man, I don't even know what Excel is. And I'm 23 years old. Neither one of those is wrong but you have to have a coaching approach and an information relaying approach that lands in the middle. And too often they say it has to be bucketed in one of these two when there's like 50 buckets that things fall into when it comes down to it. And I know this isn't the question, but you know, I've listened to a lot of your stuff, Rob. Um, I've uh, obviously you probably don't remember, but I've pinned you down in a couple corners before to, to pick your brain on some things. <laughs> um, but it's, it's just, you know, simple things like you talk about how there's this whole litany, this spectrum of where these guys can, kind of understand and finding those, you know, internal cues, external cues, uh, verbal cues, a million different things. Like if you don't mind going in a little more on kind of, kind of dialing that in, I know I just rambled again. So my bad. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, no, I think it's, and I like your, your example, Ryan, of Darren O'Day. I think those guys that don't fit the mold are, that's really interesting. That's where you should, sometimes we have this preconceived, everyone has to fit this model. Yeah. Right? That's what deception is, right? Uh, I think that's where it seem shifted wake I bet came from. Like that's people. Oh, why, why doesn't this left-hander fit the model of, of, you know, getting people out? They're doing something weird. And I think you can learn a lot from looking at those, those cases. And, and instead of just focusing on, right. Just 
trying to pin everything into this the, the little holes, <laughs> little bins that you've predefined. Um, but yeah, no, Jordan, I think, you know, I, the other thing I found is there's massive individual difference in how much each athlete wants data, what they can absorb, how they use it, what kind of cues you give them. So you're right. I think you're right. Good coaches are just really sensitive to that. And they know it, how to, for each athlete they work with. I, I got a question for you, Rob. It's kind of burning in my head where you're talking about athletes relationship to data and, you know, in the human performance side of things in medical, I, I'm curious in terms of how athletes. So, you know, some athletes use something called the whoop band and, and, there were a few of them that got really aversive to it, yeah, especially on game days. You know, most pitchers, they don't sleep that well before their game day, starters particularly, because they, they're they amped up. And uh, they were getting feedback on their sleep that wasn't positive, you know, on game day. And, you know, there's certain colors that we use in monitoring athletes. And one is the color red. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder, you know, when they show, you know, you're, you're in a – you know, a negative zone, you know, you're not recovering well, or you have too much daily strain or some of the measures that are available in a lot of technology. I'm curious in terms of what you might have seen in your line of work of how athletes relate to that. You know, what, what can happen in terms of you're talking about internalization, but what happens if, you know, you, there's something wrong with what the data says, how did they get past it? Yeah, I think there's a few points too. So one of the things we you know I've studied a bit. I and we, we were talking about what pitcher studies. I've done. I've have done one on focus. Focus of attention is a big thing. What you put your attention on, whether it's on the outside, you know, on what the hitters, how they're reacting to your fastball, how they that swing look, versus inside, you know, what how am I feeling? Am I what's my elbow doing? You know, the inside one is really dangerous and in, in games, it really um, impairs performance. Though so one study I did, I looked at pitchers that were recovering from elbow surgery and I showed kind of they're more, they're, they're focused on their elbow, right? They're worried about hurting it. So yeah, I think those kind of, those things can be dangerous, right? I think like from personal life, I think everyone's had experience where you got really bad night's sleep, but you did just fine um, because you just got to put it aside, right? If you obsess over it and start worrying about what the effects might be, I think that can be really, really bad. So um, yeah, you know, that mindset that of where, what you're focused on, I think um, we have to be careful um, with that. You know, um, I think that's a good example, Ryan, of the sleep, right? Telling someone they didn't get enough sleep what's, what can you do about it after it's done? Well, it's only going to get them thinking about something you probably don't want them to. So, so that, that's a good point. Yeah. One of the, I mean, even with our company, we, we had talked about how we're using colors, how we're using figures or arrows, you know, to determine changes in strength levels. Um, and what we really had gone to is a different color coding system and to be able to communicate uh, very simply of what the, the athlete or the coach may need to do. Um, because that's, that's another thing too, I see with data is it, if, if it's not clearly stated in terms of like, you know, the, what and the why and the how, so like what you're seeing, why is it important, you know, to look at this data point, but how are you going to change it? There is a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. Um, and I noticed too, and, and I don't know in your experience and if you could talk about it working with pro teams, but the use of adjustment logs, like how, how should we be going about recording our mechanical changes, how to, how we log, how athletes learn. I, I don't know if you have some insights in terms of like what coaches should be doing to get a more global perspective. You know, here's the change I want to make. Here's the communication. How am I evaluating it? What's the feedback that the athlete needs? I don't know if you got any insights there. Yeah, that that's a good, I think, you know, we have so many tools now, you know, biomechanic labs and recording, we can, we can measure things much more. And I think you, you kind of have to separate the measurement, the description part from the instruction cueing part is one mm -hmm. thing, right? You don't want to, if you do do this big analysis of how someone's changed their stride or, or whatever, I don't, you've got to be careful about telling the pitcher about all the details of that, that movement, I think using it as a coach to plan things, I think it is one thing. So, so yeah, I think that's kind of, you know, and the other, you know, we, we talked about a bit about this before uh, going on the air. I'm, I'm a big believer in kind of letting the, the changes, you know, 
uh, using kind of like constraints led approach where you kind of encourage the athlete to find the changes themselves. Um, you still, you still want to track them as a coach, but I think um, being too over descriptive about it and trying to get the athlete here, do this specific thing with your elbow. I've found that that doesn't work as well as if you can create a practice activity that encourages them to do that um, without kind of telling them, um, you know, whether it's a connection ball or throwing a heavier ball or something like that. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of, you know, about how coaching and, and, and tracking the changes, I think, like I said, is a separate thing from coaching the changes and instructing the changes. Definitely. Yeah. I think, you know, if you could dive into it, because you, you were talking about it is the constraint led approach. I don't know if people really know what those elements are in, in, in terms of the approach. So like, I'm wondering if you could go through those things. For people. Yeah. So, you know, the one example I, I, I always like is, you know, if you have a pitcher there, you know, they're, you know, sometimes it's called forearm fly out or their arms separating too early. Like they're, they're generating a velocity by a lot of arm action. Um, you know, the, in some cases we would, we want to kind of get rid of that because it's, you know, chance of injury and, and putting a lot of force um, in your elbow, not always, but it depends on the case. But what I've found over the years and kind of the, the way I think of things, trying to tell the pitcher how specifically how to move to get rid of that, like telling them, keep your arm closer to your body or bend your elbow less, doesn't work very well. Um, your body's not really good at being told what to do specifically like that, I find. Um, instead, what we want to do is add a, a constraint. So a constraint is something you add to practice that takes away something or changes the task. So if I give you a connection ball and say, throw now pitch so that when this connection ball, like a big kid's rubber ball, when it falls out, I want it to go towards where you're throwing the ball towards the, the plate. Now, if you separate your arm too early from your body, the ball falls out and goes backwards every time. So I've created this new task. I've added this new constraint that in order to satisfy this new thing I've created, you have to change your delivery but I haven't told you anything about how, right? I'm going to let you self-organize and figure that out on your own as a, as a pitcher. I'm not telling you what to do with your elbow or your leg. Um, I'm giving you this new practice activity where you can play around and get the, try to get the connection ball to go forward and, and change your delivery. Um, that in, so kind of encourage the, the, the movement we want. Um, another, you know, so that that's kind of the example of the constraints that approach. So adding something to the task, um, you know, whether it's a connection ball, pitching on a different mound, pitching in sand sometimes um, to try to get to, to what you're trying to do basically is take away the, what they're doing now and get them to explore something different, make what they're doing now less effective and get them to explore and try to find a different way of doing it. That's it, kind of the idea behind it. Can you go yeah. over a couple examples just because I think this is important is you see a lot of people confuse what is not the constraint leads approach. So do you have a couple of just like key indicators? Like that definitely is not the constraint leads approach because you'll see sometimes, you know, someone will like one of the examples I have is someone will just throw like a band onto somebody and then tell them, Hey, go, go run. Hey, I'm, I'm doing constraint led approach with sprints. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe that is the constraint leads approach, but is there some, some key factors that are not the constraint leads approach? Yeah, no, I think that's a good, good example, Jordan. I think the word constraint, it confuses people a lot. Like we're just constraining you physically. Like um, for me, it has to be a purposeful, right? Um, like if you have a back catcher that's having problem with, you know, they're um, not getting in front of the ball when they, to block it, right? They're trying to do everything with their glove, you know, take away, you know, um, to make them catch with one hand behind their back, that kind of thing. So it, to me, it's much more purposeful. Um, just adding a band without asking why you're doing that. What are you trying to make the athlete do? Um, I think it is different. There's a different kind of um, approach I talk, like I think is differential learning where you just get them to try a whole bunch of random stuff to kind of get the feel, explore, right? Uh, using lots of different ball weights and mound heights without any specific thing you're trying to work on or having different bat weights is something I use. Um, that's more of a differential learning approach, I would call it, which can be beneficial too. But a constraints to me is like, I'm purposely adding this to try to get you to do something else. Mm -hmm. yeah. I got so constraint, oh, go let me, now tell me if I'm oversimplifying it. Constraint would be more, I'm trying to get a movement 
out of something and differential learning would be, I'm just trying to get the task. So if it's, I'm using a six ounce ball, I'm using a nine inch ball, a seven ounce ball, and then we're going to randomly throw a football in there off the mound. And we're going to just get you to be able to throw strikes. That would be mm -hmm. differential for me. Yeah. For me, okay. I think you're, you're just getting the person to kind of uh, learn how to produce different movements, right? So um, learning how to throw, get the different weight balls over the uh, different, all the plate is going to help them understand the relationship between their movements and the outcome, mm -hmm. right? So I think, yeah, for me, that's kind of the difference between the two approaches. And I think they're both beneficial and sometimes I actually combine them. Um, whereas, you know, an, another, like a paper I have out is, uh, a few years ago, I worked a lot with hitters increasing each launch angle, right? When that was all, all the rage, getting the ball in the air more. And the constraint we had, like a simple one, was just a fence across the field, right? You hit the ball into the fence, you're out, right? So I've, I've changed the task now that you can't hit the ball on the ground. I've added this constraint of the fence. And I let people pr practice with that and kind of varying it in different ways. And you basically have to learn to adjust your swing to get the ball in the air more to get it over the fence. That, that's kind of a very simple example. You know, one of the things, you know, I thought about in this constraint led approach is how do we, how do we involve the organism level? So for instance, like with hitters, one of the things I realized is that we weren't doing, I think in practice enough simulation for them to control their heart rate, handling mm -hmm handling physiologic stress. So I'm wondering in this example, what, what we wanted to propose is to do a very intense skipping set, you know, with a rope, jump, jump rope, uh, to get their heart rates as elevated as high as possible before they go in the cages. I mean, how do we, one of the things that I'm very interested in practice planning is how do we introduce stress? How can we teach our athletes in terms of, um, experiencing stress, but also being able to command themselves in a way that they're going to thrive when they have these physiologic symptoms or there's, there's intense mental pressure. You know, I, I'd love to lean on you to hear about what coaches yeah. can do. Yeah, no, that's a great example too, Ryan, for me of the using constraints again. So going back, the reason that we do this, right? The reason we don't want to try to teach the one perfect delivery, right? There's mm -hmm the athlete, you have to throw this way is because the constraints in, are changing in your natural environment, right? You, you have to throw strikes in the ninth inning when you're tired, right? Your whole body's different really, you know, and you still need, to, so you need to be able to adjust. And by practicing that adaptability, adjustability, you, it, it, you get that. That's what we're trying to achieve instead. So you can't throw exactly the same way to get the same outcome location because things are changing. And you know, the phrase we use sometimes, this researcher Bernstein, repetition without repetition, right? Hitting your target, repeating the outcome. To do that, you can't repeat the exact same movement because things are changing, right? So that's the basic idea. So yeah, I think we don't do nearly enough of that in practice, like pra getting athletes to practice when they're tired, getting them to practice. There's lots of wonderful work showing pressure, practicing under pressure, whether you create it, I do simple things like it doesn't even have to be pressure related to the game. Um, I do things in with hitters, you know, where you, you put them in a group and you say the one that has the worst outcome is going to have to do a little speech in front of everybody about <laughs> at the end of practice. And people don't like that. Right. So they start thinking about, oh, crap, I gotta, and you want to get them <laughs> used to that pressure of worrying about the outcome of their hitting, right? So you get them used to that and practice with the hope that when it happens in the game, you know, they're, they're used to this kind of tendency you wanna turn inward like and focus on what you're doing too much. Um, so I think, yeah, getting athletes used to stress, fatigue, you know, all these things, I think in practice, instead of trying to hope that they figure it out. I, and I know teams are starting to do this, right? I know like, um, I was really impressed with the, what, the way you guys in, uh, and the angels and stuff, what you would do in spring training, you'd, the guys would pitch a little bit, then go immediately into the gym, right? So you're trying to stretch them out by not just pitching. like. But um, So I, I really think um, I love that idea. We don't do nearly enough of that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just on that, I think a lot of people, just in the game of baseball overall, and, you know, I've talked with a couple buddies in a bunch of different organizations and, 
everyone's monitoring, you know, how recovered they think the athlete is. Mm -hmm. And the biggest aspect of baseball is it's not necessarily the physical drain, especially for an everyday player. You know, like when, when they started monitoring my buddy, I won't say the organization, but they, uh, they took batting practice and they were like, yeah, you can only do batting practice twice a week. Now it's just too stressful. (laughs) And it's like, do you realize like, no, that it's just because it it comes off as stressful because we sit around at a locker all day and eat Mm -hmm. the spread. You know, that's why we can't take BP. (laughs) It's like, this guy hit a double, no sprint work. Like he just ran 180 feet, Mm -hmm. like no sprint work, really no sprint work for three days. He's, he's fatigued. He hit two doubles. It's like, Mm -hmm. that's not, that's not the, the killer of the season. It's the psychological stress. But then everyone says, like, we need to make these guys tougher, but let's make sure they do less. We need to make (laughs) these guys tougher, but don't put too much pressure on them in practice because we don't want them to break. We need to make these guys tougher, so don't talk to that guy about what this hitter does because we don't want him to be too too worried out there. But we keep saying this, like, we need these guys to be tough. We need them to be men. We need them to get back to 1970s baseball where they roll out of a garbage can and dive into third base head first and not worry about it. But then it's like, well, don't don't say anything negative to him because we don't want them to be offended at it like that. He, his fastball is not at, at major league average. So, like, where's the balance between this? Because this is something I got a lot of pushback for, too, with the Angels. When I would put up these like, I want to take a test group and I want to psychologically stress these guys like three of the six days a week. And I just want to drain them psychologically. Give them a little recovery day. And as they get better with it, just keep hammering out this psychological stress. And then see how they handle performance anxiety versus everyone else. And which one is more recovered at the end of the year, the guy who's mentally taxed or the guy who's physically taxed. Cause I don't really think, and this is my belief. I, I, I agree with Ryan strength is the number one way to, 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 to monitor a fatigue, but is strength showing up because the neural, the neurological systems fried because mentally they're cashed out because everyone like, you know, spring training, Week three of spring training, Ryan, how many guys are showing up early to the clubhouse? Oh, yeah. You know, it's like week week one, everyone's got their collared (laughs) shirt on. They got Uh, their fancy shoes. Week three, people start showing up in sweatpants, you know, shirts with, you know, holes in them. They got mustard stains on stuff. They're like, I don't, I don't know. I just rolled out of bed and got here. And then it's like August. And then everyone breaks for camp. And then you have the guys in extended and they're like, what am I doing here? (laughs) <laughs> Why am I in extended spring? This is stupid. I'm over. This is dumb. They're not fatigued. They're just mentally checked out, mm-hmm. you know, and then like that, then extended breaks. And then you have your short seasons and the guys who get stuck in the Arizona league or the Florida, Florida league. They're the same way. This is stupid. Why am I playing against the giants black squad again? Now you got to play giants orange tomorrow. I played these guys for 59 <laughs> straight days and extended. <laughs> and then as soon as the, the all-star star break ends in the full seasons, you have all those guys that it's like, yeah, you're setting all these PRs on your jump heights. You're doing all this great stuff, but your performance sucks because you're just mentally just fried on not knowing how to deal with these psychological factors of being the beer batter. Or if it's past the seventh inning, the apple juice batter. And then you strike out and everyone's cheering because you just struck out and everyone's like yelling insults at you in mm-hmm. you know middle of nowhere, Arkansas. And you're like, <laughs> what is going on? I'm not used to this. To where like, how do we psychologically... I know I just rambled a whole bunch of games, <laughs> no, like 50 no. examples, but how do we psychologically stress guys in an appropriate manner? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I really believe in, in a lot of what you're saying too, that we need to push a little bit harder. Like what I always say is like learning's messy. Like if you want to improve, you need to make people fail, right? You need to make it really hard when everyone does everything perfectly in a practice session, nobody improved anything. That was a, performance yeah. that was a recital i always right? tell guys like yeah. if it looks clean in practice it wasn't it wasn't done right yeah you didn't push people there's a mm-hmm. place for that like to build people's confidence and when you get before a game but when you if you really want to improve something you do i think you have to push people um challenge them at the right level and i think i think a lot of the practices are just going through the motion i agree when we could be so i think like thinking of a periodization kind of like when there's sessions where you're going to really push people psychologically. Um, I agree, you know, putting some sort of pressure, like I said, that you can do um, a variety of different things where you put like social pressure, 
you know, there's a bunch of scouts here evaluating you, you know, um, you know, competitive pressure. We make some sort of game out of it for the athletes, some um, distraction, you know, all these kind of things. I think, I think those are a really good idea. I think I agree with, and I think there's, um, you know, there's a colleague here that I have, he does a lot of work on mental fatigue and, uh, and he, he, you know, he argues that a lot of that's just boredom, right? You're not challenging mm -hmm. people at the right level. And this example, like he always gives is, you know, if I, if I, if you just ran a marathon and I offered you a, like hundred five thousand dollars to run another one, most people couldn't do it, right? They're physically fatigued. If you just spent like six hours writing an exam and I offered you a five thousand, most people could do it, like because they could sum it up. So it's mm -hmm. not the same as physical fatigue. It's not this depletion of resources. It's just you're bored, <laughs> right? I, uh, I but, have a story to go with yeah. that when you're done. Remind yeah. me. Yeah. So I think, I think, yeah, I totally agree. I think, you know, both with the way we treat, like baseball is tough, especially pitch, what you guys do, injury pitching, because there's injury concerns. But I think we tend to treat things like they're made of glass sometimes, like especially once a hitter's on a, you know, in a rhythm or pitcher's getting, you, you, that we don't want to break them. Whereas in practice, I think we should try to, dude, that's where you want things to fail and figure out the adjustments and adaptations, not in the game, not wait for it to happen. So yeah, I, I like all that, those ideas for sure. So before, before I tell my story, uh, you said treat them like glass. And this was something I always said is like, if you treat a player like glass, don't be surprised when they shatter like it mm -hmm. is. And what I like using the system for right now is most of the guys I work with from a private setting, I get because they're hurt. And, you know, they, they go through the rehab, they do the MRI, there's nothing wrong. So they're like, yeah, you should be good. You should be good to be cleared to throw hundred percent, no issues. So I get them. But now when I have them in the system, if they're checking all the, the measures of our KPIs, which, you know, is from a whole bunch of information from Ryan, some information and in public research and all these other things. If they're checking those boxes, then it's, you, you know, you're, you're ready to have that conversation with them and go, okay, look, it's time to build your volume. I'm going to tell you how far I need you to throw. You just tell me how long you went. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you mean? I can tell me when you're done throwing, write it down. Tell me what you did. Did you throw for 10, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes? If you're strong enough to handle it, and that's how much I believe in strength, let's check those boxes and build some volume and make sure you're good to go for those fatigue things. And I think mentally it's like putting, you know, 300 pounds, or if you're me, a hundred pounds on your back for a squat and doing that one rep max, you know? That's psychologically going to be challenging. Ryan, I was making a knock at my strength base. You didn't even <laughs> chuckle, dude. Come on. But it's like if you're when you're doing those one rep max or three rep max, I think psychologically that builds not just that mental capacity, but it also builds physical capacity at the same time. So I think there's there's importance in going, I think I can do A. Well, let's try to go A.5 and really push you past that. So psychologically, we can stress that. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I think no, it's important no, I to think do. So I think, you know. A challenging people belief, you know, uh, I was, I can't remember the exact details, but when I give presentations, I always like to tell the story of like Roger Bannister of running the marathon. Like mm -hmm. how long did it take before uh, running the four minute mile? How mm -hmm. many people did, did long did it take to break that? It took a year, like before him, nobody did it. The week after a whole bunch of people, the next month, like three or four people did it. Cause they knew mm -hmm. it was possible. Exactly. Right? <laughs> like it, it just suddenly, you know, set a new goal for people. Um, so yeah, no, I think that's, that's a really good uh, point. And the other, you know, I would rate to, you know, in the, I think there's a lot of really new, interesting research coming about injury. Um, you know, I think we've always focused on two things with injury, oh, doing too much and doing it wrong. Right. You're throwing too many pitches, you're throwing your deliveries bad. The new thing I think is coming out is you're doing it too, too much the same. Right? Mm -hmm. I think variability, adding different conditions in practice is a way that you can, you know, not doing the same delivery, doing the same delivery actually every time is that's what's going to hurt you, <laughs> right? You, you stress the exact same joints and same things. So adding a little bit of variation, I think, is a way to kind of mitigate injury. And I, there's, I, there's some, yeah. I like that. I like that. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but no, no problem. It, in my biomechanics research, there's a couple of things that I had seen. So I had very high level division one college players that I've analyzed and very um, low level youth athletes. And it was the biggest spread in, in pro ball. It's, it's a little bit more refined um, mm -hmm. looking at the mechanics there, but what you can see in biomechanics is that when you look at these youth athletes, 
their standard deviations and the way they move are really wide. So you're looking at all these different biomechanical variables and there's, there's a lot of variability. But then as you're kind of moving up the chain in terms of their ability, their, their variability starts to shrink. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking, looking at the, the standard deviations, they get very much closer to the mean of a value. And in my mind, I was like, you know what, maybe there's an opposite training approach here. You know, you, you have this athlete that is highly, in, relatively highly invariable in your mm -hmm. college or your upper level pitcher. And then you got this youth athlete that maybe we need to find more consistency in our training because they're inherently more variable. Their, mm -hmm. their mechanics are more variable. So it's just, that's an interesting kind of feature that along the lines, you know, makes sense, you know, looking just from a biomechanical perspective. Yeah, no, for sure. And so, yeah, I think like adding variability to practice conditions, like the lowest hanging fruit <laughs> of it, like to improve, but you do have to scale it appropriately. So if you, you're a really young athletes going to bring their own variability, their yeah. inconsistency. So you don't want to overwhelm like a, a young hitter mm -hmm. with a pitching machine that could put different spins and speeds and all like, that. There's going to be too chaotic for them. But as you're you giving get them a PhD up, yeah. when they're not even through you know, exactly. their, their diploma yeah. yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, so you do, you do have to, you kind of want to match it to the athlete. Uh, the, um, but I think, you know, some of those, those findings, I think, I think they're a bit misleading because what, when you get to be really skilled, I think what variability gives you is ability to adapt to the conditions. Like we we're saying, yeah. when you get tired, when you have a different yeah. hitter, what those data are from is when there's no, like they're, they, you know, the, the ASMI guys getting people to throw 10 fastballs in a row in a perfectly sterile lab with, you know, yeah. no hitter present. So yes, they're more consistent, but I think if you change the conditions, you would see that they can adjust and adapt and do different yeah. things to, to keep, keep their, you know, delivery when they're fatigued and things like that. So, but yeah, that's a good point, Ryan. You do want to. Um, yeah. You make a great point that, that, that in our study, in our research, even when we were evaluating athletes, we need to make it more game-like. You know, mm -hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense to me um, to really see the adjustability in the athlete. And, and that was something in my study was really interesting for my dissertation is they threw simulated games. We didn't have a batter, mm -hmm. but we, I grossly changed their stride length. So, so, you know, by almost 24% of their body height. And mm -hmm. what I found was really interesting is this, this is sort of like this the self-organization principle is that velocities did not change. It didn't matter how badly I adjusted the way they threw. Mm -hmm. They were able to figure out how to maintain fastball velocity, which mm -hmm. is so fascinating in athletes that maybe you're right. In, in these upper level athletes, these compensations are going on all the time. There, there could be a lot of change. that we I can have make a follow-up question when you're done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, yeah, um, I think what we're starting to see is this, you know, this, like I said, moving beyond the idea that you move the same way every time. What we're seeing is we call them in research motor synergies. So when mm -hmm. your stride is a little bit shorter, your elbow goes a little bit. Your body is working together, adjusting. Okay. Um, there's okay. a really great pitching study, actually, I can point to where basically they, they looked what they did was you had, they had people throw 10 pitches and they reconstructed one delivery using the joint angles from thing. And what they did was they took joint angles from 10 different pitches. So your knee angle from pit, the first pitch you threw, your elbow from the second. Your, so if you're doing the same delivery every time, right? It shouldn't matter if I take your knee angle from the first or the 10th, they're the same. But what they found was that did matter. If you took them all from the same one delivery, you got better results than if they're scattered, right? So mm -hmm. I think this that that adjustment, like your your research, what you're seeing is you throw off the stride length and somewhere else down the line, the body's automatically adjusting for, yeah. for a good pitcher to compensate for that, um, which you can't, you know, they're not do So it's not the same movement. It's a, this synergy, uh, functional variability, I, I call it sometimes. Yeah. That's a cool so, word. Hey, yeah. Ryan, here's, here's my follow-up question. Of your group, I'm a firm believer that higher end players are elite compensators. Of those guys who were able to maintain their velocity with all those changes, how do you do you know? I don't know if you track this information. 
but how many of them went on to play in professional baseball or have good collegiate careers or even get to the big leagues? Do you, do you know? Out of my particular research? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or has it still been too little for that, that to actually occur? No, no. In my study, there were a couple, nobody, I don't think signed with a major league team, but a lot of them were um, independent league mm -hmm. from the, from the division one level. Okay. And that, that's what I was wondering. Like, did they go on to have decent indie ball mm -hmm. careers? Cause you know, it's, I it's pro ball pro ball at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had That would them. be interesting to look that up and then you can come back on with a, with a blog <laughs> post or something on our, on our update with that. Yeah. And I think that's a, Ryan, that's a great example of trying to break the glass. Like we're talking about, right. Why would you take a good pitcher and try to make him do a different stride length? Like that's most people would be, that's dumb. But that's how you learn to, you have to learn to compensate by someone to forcing you, to, right? In practice, if we force you to do that in practice, it allows you to do it in the game when it happens, you know, for whatever other reason. So, yeah, I think that that's a, that's a good example of what we're talking about. I mean, it's, it's crazy what you're saying, because I, I think we make a lot of adjustments um, with, with pitchers and we don't really have a basis. You know, we need, we say in our, or in our business is that, strength matters most. And then, you know, you need to evaluate performance. So the athlete has to be strong to be able to make mechanical changes because even small changes that we make, like moving a pitcher on the mound, you know, if we put a pitcher and he throws on the furthest glove hand side, and then we move him to the furthest arm side, there are biomechanical effects of that. But these changes, they, they happen so rapidly. It's, mm -hmm. it's interesting, you know, that's a constraint in itself is that, you know, if you take a pitcher that's really closed off and he throws on the glove side and he strides towards the middle of the, the mound and now he's still closed, you don't change his delivery and you put him all the way on the arm side. Well, now he had, you'll see their trunk starts angling more towards the middle of the mound to try to get back on line. There's all these things mm -hmm. that happen and it's just so interesting, you know, that sometimes we don't evaluate what are all these changes and can they be causing a problem? And I'm like where your mentality is at, Hey, if they're performing well and they're pain free, it's probably a good idea to let them be, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's maybe it kind of, my mind goes, is it possible that we may be coaching athletes at times into injuries because we're into poor performance. Yeah. yeah. So this I, is I, again, just to you, 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 <laughs> You, you stoked my fire on it <laughs> is there is so many players that I'm either working with currently or have worked with in the past or have reached out through, Hey, this player told me to contact you on this type of situation. And it's like, Hey, I just signed. I'm in my first year of pro ball. I have thrown 15 innings and I did really well in my first year. They just paid me two and a half million dollars. And they tell me I need to change everything that I do. Mm -hmm. it's the only industry in the world that I'm aware of that we go, I'm going to buy two and a half million dollars of this stock. And then I'm going to purposely go in and change it. Cause I, I just don't think it's going to perform well. Mm -hmm. It's like, who, who's investing two and a half million dollars into something on the bet that is not going to perform well with what it's doing. You don't go <laughs> buy a, you know, a Ferrari and go, I need to start putting a ton of aftermarket parts on this. Cause this thing is not going to work when I go to I guess they're not all now push button ignitions, you know, mm -hmm. but if you go in and you buy, you know, and again, I always talk about Honda civics, a ton of aftermarket parts for Honda civics. Cause they're kind of just like a run of the mill car. I drive one, you know, Croton, you used to drive one, you know, we, mm -hmm. we were Honda civic buddies, <laughs> but it's like, you can throw aftermarket parts on that because it's like, well, it's not a, it's not a high precision machine. It can, can deal with a little slop in there, but when they, they invest this money and they go through and they go, we got to change everything this guy's doing. You know, we coach them not only into injury, but what I think is more alarming for a player's career that's getting paid a large chunk of money is you coach them into poor performance because that's a quick way to be a busted prospect. And if you're a busted prospect and if Baseball America says you're a bad prospect, you just got written off by 30 teams. It doesn't matter if someone likes you. Those teams are writing you off. If you get hurt and Baseball America says you're good, you're going to get another chance. You might get seven more chances when it comes yeah. down to it. But if someone says you're bad, and it's not your fault, but someone changed you and lessened your induced vertical break or took away your deception because you don't fit the mold. And that's what mm -hmm. you're talking about. It's like when you're outside the mold and no one can, can explain it, oh, he's just deceptive. Yeah. And so long as they're doing fine and no one's worried about it, they let you do what you want. 
But I, th- I think that's just something that's important is, you know, coaches and evaluators is we need to understand just because it doesn't fit the mold doesn't mean that it's wrong. For sure. Yeah, I 100% agree. You know, there's lots of different ways to do things. And we do, you know, our organizations get a philosophy about how people hit or how people throw in. They kind of try to fit everybody into that mold. I think it is dangerous. And mm-hmm. yeah, I think, I, you know, there's some good. And Ryan, I think with, with your example, you know, we have this, our body trying to perform, but we also have these kind of comp- injury built in your body will kick in these compensatory mechanisms so it doesn't hurt itself. Right. And, and you have to fight against those, um, that, you know, those, like you said, adjusting the torso. And I think I used to run a lot and I, everyone's probably had this experience where you, you get a little bit injured on your ankle and you keep running and then you yeah. have a hip injury on the other side <laughs> a week yeah. later. Right. Yeah. Um, because your body, like, I, I, you know, yeah. I, I don't run, I never run, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think, yeah, those, those are some good points. Yeah. I think, you know, we do not by not both, both ways. I think Jordan, Jordan and Ryan, by pushing people into a thing that doesn't, you know, I think in get real technical term, we, we talk about what it's called intrinsic dynamics. You have your own built in way you coordinate movement and, and we can't, so I like to say, you know, coaching is renovation. It's not cons- new construction, mm-hmm. right? You have to build on what the athlete already has. You can't, force a two-story house on an athlete that doesn't have that and jordan your point is like i see this in other sports too basketball they're like they bring in some shot guru to try to change someone's jump shot and i'm like well why did you draft this guy oh he's a good shooter I'm like, well, what are you doing then right you know so i i really think that those are some good points guys i just sure. wrote that down coaching is renovation I, not new construction i, I think that's great yeah, right. yeah. that's, in my, that's you know, in my, my new book uh, the, yeah, the, uh, it's in there so yeah, yeah, no, I think you have to, and I think evaluate what the athletes has, what they're good at. And although, you know, I think we're recognizing like Ryan, you, what you do, we can take a pitcher that doesn't throw very hard and make them throw harder. Like you can increase the capacity, but you have to do it in a way that fits with their body and what they can do. For yeah, sure. To give a, a real world baseball example, you talked about the shot guru that comes in. Mm-hmm. I won't use the name, but I had a buddy who uh, his son was drafted within the first 10 rounds with a, a very well-known pitching development organization. And he calls me, goes, Oh, I'm so excited. My son just got drafted. This is it's they're known for just getting guys to the big leagues. And I said, Oh, tell your son, don't let him touch his, touch his curveball." <laughs> what do you mean? He got one of the best curveballs in all college baseball, baseball America says so well, this organization doesn't like curveballs. So for whatever reason, they're really good when they trade for players, they get to the big leagues in like a week when they draft a player, they usually don't get past high a and he goes, Oh, I don't think they'll do that. They invested X amount of money into him. So, well, just be aware of it. So I'm monitoring his stats. And all of a sudden when he gets moved up from low a to high a, he has a huge drop off in his strikeout to walk ratio. His K per nine goes down as his walk percent goes up. So I shoot him a text message. I go, did they change? Did they take away his curveball. What did they do? He goes, you know what? I'm actually going in town. I'm going to see him pitch. I'll ask him. I'll see what he says. He goes, I haven't really talked to him. They're busy. He texts me about three days later, four days later. And he goes, yeah, they have him throwing a slider now. And he goes, well, <laughs> you know, there you have it. Just if it was me, I would say, tell him they're throwing a curveball and just say, yeah, it's a slider. He started <laughs> doing that. He finished the year in triple A, but it's, it's a slider, but it's just one of those things. Like that's, I think a lot of, a lot of groups get tagged as like, oh, we're, we're the, we're the renovators. Mm-hmm. But what they do is they identify other people's talent really well they take that and they let them do what they do but mm-hmm. then they almost put this you know godly look upon what their own pd department does and they'll draft a young player and then you know those guys just they don't get to the big leagues when they draft those guys you know so it's always interesting like you know you see some of these guys they go well we just got this guy from double a AA or triple a with you know whatever organization it may be we're not going to redo that guy we might do some tweaks here and there, but we're not changing anything. But then when they get their new guy, they're like, this is a full new construction bill. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's what kind yeah. of brought that to mind again, mm-hmm. another ramble, sure. but no, no, for sure. That's exactly, you know, the kind of the attitude, uh, you know, that what the being achieving is almost irrelevant, you know, what people did. It's like, what are the tools, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. The fact that the guy could walk a lot or get a lot of, you know, oh, that's irrelevant. We, we, the, the, you know, we, we don't care. You can't do it that way in the big. So we got to change it. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. No, it's a good idiot for sure. 
So Rob, you have um, your own podcast, the Perception and Action Podcast, and then you mm-hmm. mentioned it before. I want you to talk about the book that you just uh, you just published. Yeah, so I have a, a book that just came out a couple um, six weeks or so ago called "How We Learn to Move: uh, Revel- Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills." And um, yeah, so it was kind of I wanted it to be kind of a, a place where people could start that are kind of hearing about things like self organization or constraints or the idea of a variability practice, like. There's a lot of good materials out there, but it's fairly high level. We were talking about this before we went on the air, right? Because the you can overwhelm people with terminology in in this area. So I wanted to write one that's a bit more accessible, where people could understand these ideas and and how it relates to. Also, we, there's chapters in the book about relating it to injury, relating it to use of technology and analytics, um, this this kind of new way of thinking about being skillful moving beyond the idea that, you know, all the things we've been talking about, there's only one way to do it. Got to get rid of that idea. The way to get better is to re- trying to repeat the same thing over and over, <laughs> right? We want to get rid of that idea. So um, that's like the psychological side of things too. So yeah, so that that's the the book I, I just have had come out and got a, a really uh, overwhelming response to it for me. I was surprised. You never know who's going <laughs> to listening to you. So, and then the, uh, the podcast, The podcast is a bit, especially in recent episodes, I'm way deep in the weeds of the heavy stuff. So if you're new to this, I wouldn't recommend going in and just jumping in the recent ones. But the book is probably a better place to start. Yeah, the podcast is great. It's something I've listened to a lot. So anyone listening should definitely jump on and Mm -hmm. and give it more than one one listen. Dig back into those episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Go back a little bit. (laughs) It's getting I'm I'm getting more and more uh, details and stuff uh, as we go. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Rob, I think this has been great. Um, definitely uh, one of our better podcasts. I love it. Um, and just appreciate you coming on. Oh, thanks, guys. That was a lot of fun. Yep. Until next time. Take care.